If you're starting a business or you're actually running a business, you can cross compare your business, your opportunity with these commandments to see if it is potentially possible for your business to actually change your life in a short period of time. And not just your life, but your family. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Stenzano, host of the Jake and Gino podcast here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, chef, father, six, best-selling author, the G-Daddy. Gino Barber, Gino, how's it going? Stenzi, I'm doing great today. And before you announce the guest, I just want to say we did a podcast with this guest back in 2017, and that's when my entrepreneurial journey started. And I read his book, Millionaire Fast Lane. And for me, it changed everything because it validated what we were doing. And we're one of the one or two or 3%. And everyone listening to the podcast aspires to be an entrepreneur. There are very few people out there that write and speak entrepreneurship and that are doing it. He's a guru. He's not just a guru. He's actually doing it out there. And the books really inspired us. I love all this, all the content that is written. He's come out with a great rat race. We're going to discuss that now, but I just wanted to give a big shout out and a big thanks for him. I caught him at the right time, Jake. He was just at the right time for us, bro. The stars have aligned. So mm -hmm. very excited about this. So today's guest went from living with his mom and mopping floors to retire in his 30s. So that's, that's an accomplishment of himself, maybe speaking to the millennials out there these days, right? He is a self-made multimillionaire who challenges the conventional means of acquiring wealth. So without further ado, MJ DeMarco, welcome to the show. Hey guys, it's great to be back. Good to see you guys again. It is our pleasure. And now, you know, bear with me because Gino says I always just jump right to the point and I, I never massage it. So we're going to have some pleasantries. Give us your story for the folks that don't know you yet, please. Uh, sure. Um, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life, actually, the, but the results of that uh, wasn't very reflective of my early years because it took me about five, six years to actually become a successful entrepreneur. Uh, I turned on to entrepreneurship uh, really young when I was like 12, 13, not even, I'm not even sure of the age when I saw a Lamborghini Countach and there was a young uh, person driving it or a young owner. And I was kind of like, oh, wow. You know, and I figured, I assumed this guy was a, um, you know, an actor, or an athlete, you know, professional baseball player or something. And uh, I had the balls to ask the guy what he did for a living, which anyone that owns a Lamborghini or some expensive car, um, you get that a lot. Hey, what do you do for a living? Um, mm -hmm. And this guy said he was an inventor uh, or an entrepreneur. And that's what put me on to entrepreneurship because I was, we were in a lower middle, middle-class family. Uh, paying the bills was always an issue. And I didn't want to live like that anymore. And I knew I had no chance to be an actor. I had no chance of throwing a baseball hundred miles an hour. So I said, you know, this is what I'm going to do. So I uh, went to college for five years, got a degree in marketing and finance. And as soon as I graduated college, I did not at all look for a job. I said, I'm going to start a business. So I failed um, several times. Uh, eventually in one of my jobs that I was doing was actually was a uh, manager for a limousine company and a driver. I saw a need in that particular industry, started a business there, owned that business for a good 10 or 11 years, sold it actually twice. Um, and then after I sold it, uh, the second time I started another company, uh, which was um, the company I have right now, which is a publishing business, started a business form to discuss uh, this form of entrepreneurship, which I call fast lane entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the second time I sold my company, it was a point which I realized, oh my God, I never have to work again for the rest of my life. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean uh, living in frugality, you know, like, oh my God, I don't have to work for the rest of my life. As long as I don't eat out, as long as I flush the toilet once a year, as long as I don't buy the expensive whiskey, as long as I don't do this, as long as I don't travel, I'm retired. No, it was a type of retirement where you know, I can do what I want. I can buy what I want. I can live where I want. And I can write books that, you know, might not be economically viable um, because the message- With no is, guilt, right? Correct. You're enjoying it. You're enjoying the correct. fruits of your labor. So many people carry guilt around this stuff. And I think it's a huge mistake. So I think that's a, that's a key component to it. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's one of the distinctions I make in the great rat race escape is the media likes to normalize their agenda. And the agenda that they're trying to normalize now is you will own nothing and be happy. 
Mm-hmm. And they're doing this, this, I don't want to Why say would they do that, MJ? Because it's a part of their agenda. They don't, they want to control and own everything. They want their serfs to be controlled and not have property rights and not have this and not, and they want you to be happy that way. So what they're doing is they're normalizing. I wouldn't say they've co-opted, uh, there's this movement called FIRE, and I think they've, they're doing uh, a pretty good job of co-opting it. Which so is I haven't heard of this. So you have to tell me what fire, fire is. sucks, bro. It's like retire early. Financial independence, yeah. retire early. Yeah, bro. And oh. then it, it, the concept itself is what I like to say. They're in the right neighborhood, but they're at the wrong house. Mm-hmm. Um, the whole thing is predicated on if you, if you work at your high paying job for 20 years, save everything you can, live in a shed down by the river with no running water, um, don't eat out anymore, raise your deductibles, do this, do that, buy cheap food, buy, you know, dumpster dive behind the Safeway and buy some expired meat. So you can save all that money, put it in the stock market, and then you can retire early. Uh, so this is becoming the, um, the big news that you see on the front pages of financial news websites nowadays. Mm-hmm. Jenny and Jim retired 30 years early and they show them, you know, living in a tent down by the river. And they're <laughs> staring at each other and they can't go out to eat and they're sick of each other and about to kill right. each other, right? You know, and his, and his <laughs> idea of fun is walking the dog by the river. And, you know, there was a story... And I'm not going to name names because it's not important, but he, he was a confessed, um, he loves fast cars. Well, he had to sell all the fast cars. He was confessed a, um, a, a person that loved to go to the restaurants three, four times a week. Well, he said, I can't do that anymore, but I'm financially free. Mm-hmm. No, you're not. You're time free. And that's the thing I like, the distinction I like. To Great make. distinction. Yes is you have time freedom. And so does the bomb that lives on the street. Mm-hmm. He has time freedom too, but he can't walk into that restaurant and buy what he wants. He can't buy, he can't walk into that car dealer and buy what he wants. Mm-hmm. You know, There's so- a lack of responsibility there. And the reason I'm, I'm going to make a statement on this is when I was 17 years old, I was a terrible student in high school. I absolutely was not able to learn the way that the school system was set up and it just didn't work for me and my dad and no one thought I was going to college all this other shit and it was was a big problem in my family I came to this position where I was freaked out I didn't know what I was going to do and we were trying to get me into a juco school at the time and I said dad this is freaking me out I, I can't be a part of this system I'm literally going to just run away from home and become a hobo and my whole thing was basically a, a, a dumbed down version of what you're saying. And you, you guys probably think I'm fucking nuts right now. This was a real conversation I had with my dad when I was 17 because they were putting the pressure on, dude, you got to figure your life out. You're going to be a screw up kind of thing. Right. And mm-hmm. I said, well, look, I can just go out. I'll, I'll camp. I'll live out. And I'm just going to like ride trains or something because I, I don't want any part of this. And it was a lack of responsibility. And I wasn't able to figure things out at this mm-hmm. point. So the same thing is going on. These people don't want to be the best version of themselves and actually figure out how to make it in this world and take enough responsibility to do that. So they're saying, I'm going to take what I think is an easier way out to, okay, live in this tiny little box because I can see it and I can believe it. It's not a pie in the sky. It's something that they can feel and taste. So they're actually opting out of the responsibility and the work to get to where they need to be in order to say, hey, I've checked the box, look at me. Yeah, what society gets out of that is they get someone that puts every dime that they have into the stock market and you got someone who is not consuming resources because they because they And society likes that. Yeah, because we, <laughs> we're, we're stepping outside of life. We're not going to live our life. We're going to have life live us. And that is no way to live. I mean, if your car breaks down and you need a new alternator, I don't want to be stressing over that. That could you know set people back in this type of existence. Mm -hmm. This existence is now being normalized. You see it on the front page of CNBC. That's an opportunity to get triggered. Come on. That's an opportunity to get triggered. You're missing out here. Because I I hate, (laughs) well, this is what culture does. They redefine terms. This is new. This is now financial freedom. You have, you know, uh, I don't buy nothing. I don't do nothing, but I have financial freedom. That's them redefining terms once again. Until your alternator goes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So uh, th- in my book uh, really makes that distinction. You see a, a couple that goes through the story and they um, endure that realization. So as I'm listening to you banter back and forth about alternators and living by the river and living in a tent, 
I come back to living with a life of abundance versus a life of scarcity. You don't want to live a life Absolutely. of scarcity. And you want, and I just read the book, The Alchemist. I don't know why it took me forever. I want to be Santiago going towards my freaking personal legend. I, I can't do that by living by the river. I, I can't live a life of growth and contribution if I'm doing that. People understand that are financially free. They're chasing freaking money. The three of us are chasing opportunity. Big difference. That's a big, complete mind shift. When I became quote unquote financially free and I quit the restaurant right before I had the interview with you, I was like, okay, crap. Now, if I get hit with a $5,000 dental bill for my kids, okay, Jewel, we got to buy a new car, 30 grand. Okay. That to me is financial freedom. I can pay the bill and just not skip a beat. Not is like, okay, I got to cut all my expenses. So MJ is talking about everybody. He's talking about living a life of abundance and not going out there and not just being a consumer. Because one of the biggest things that I took from his book is be a freaking producer. Don't be a consumer. And then if you produce, all of a sudden you're producing millions of dollars a year, you don't really want to consume anymore. I don't care. I've got a $50,000 car. I could be driving a $300,000 Lambo. I don't need it. That's the, that's the big mind shift that I had. I'm living a life of abundance because of what I'm doing here, because of doing the Jake and Gino community, continuing to buy assets. I don't need to consume anymore. That doesn't make me happy. If you're out there focusing It's easier on to be topped off when it's in your reach, right? Yeah. I, well, let me just finish that thought. For me, living, being, being the producer, building the businesses, that's where I get my abundance. Figure out where you get your abundance from. And it, not all entrepreneurs are out there just to make money. I mean, we're making impact. My catalyzing statement, two of them we have for Jake and Gino, is we create multifamily entrepreneurs. And the other one is people, financial intelligence can change the world for the better. That's what we're doing at Jake and Gino. That's what's driving me. And from there, we're able to monetize because we're able to provide value. So if you're out there and you're stuck and you're thinking about doing this fire movement, think again, because you're not creating impact for anybody. You're living a meager life and you're not living a life of abundance. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. It me, sounds Jay, like a Jay. loser movement. Uh, I, I don't want to say that um, because, you know, it, it's, to, you know, different strokes for different folks. Um, I agree with but, you. You, you know, what irritates me is these are the people that are on the front page of news magazines yes. now? Is 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 look? We're, we do nothing all day. We spend nothing. We do nothing, and we're financially free. No, you're not financially free. You are time free, and 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 it, it irritates me. You know, men are girls now, and girls are boy. I mean, it's 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 kind of like the same thing. Mm -hmm. Culture likes to redefine terms to suit an agenda and to suit uh, their particular narrative. And, um, you know, you'll, you're, you're going to own nothing now and be happy. That's the new one, you know, uh, and. Do they ever stop MJ and think that someone has to own the stuff? We're not going to own it, but is there somebody out there owning it? I mean, I guess the higher ups are owning it. And someone we're just... will be in control and own it. Yeah. Right? Don't they, don't they come to now. that realization? But I mean, I, I want to have my own little piece of property rights. I want to have my own. Don't do they come to that realization? Well, it can't be the little it? guy because you're, the, you're the threat. It's got to be the big corporation, the oligarchies and the media empires and the banks and, and the governments. And um... when did they start coming together, MJ? Because I remember, you know, late 2000 or early 2000s, you know, the, the big companies were the enemy. Mm -hmm. And then over the last 20 years, there's, there's been this shift where now big pharma and big government seem to be in alignment and big tech and big government seem to be in alignment. So when and, and how did this happen? Uh, well, it's just it's too much influence in politics, crony, crony politics, crony, cronyism, mm -hmm. uh, lobbyists who are paid by, you know, it's scary, though. It's like it's like the switch went off and they realized, guys, why are we fighting each other? We have we're on the same agenda. And then all of a sudden they started basically swimming well, in the same I, lane. I think the Trump presidency is what um, made them realize they can get away with anything. Mm -hmm. um, so now they're just they've just gone crazy. The media is controlled. Um, by very few entities. And unfortunately, most of the culture watches television. I don't, I don't watch television. Um, I don't watch mainstream news. Um, I'm, I'm actually very happy being culturally ignorant. <laughs> and that's because I am not interested in the pro propaganda or the brainwashing. It is the, propaganda, though. And, and that's, you know, I were talking about the other day, the stuff that's getting put out He's saying, how can these people be saying this? I can't actually believe this. And I'm saying, dude, there's an agenda. They're pushing a marketing message. They're beating a drum that's been set out to them because if you click through the channels, you'll hear the same damn thing over and over again. So there, it's it's literally marketing being pushed out to get people to do what these you yeah. know, entities want them to do. And but, I heard a story the other day about uh, an, America, uh, an American in China and um, 
the uh, the Chinese man asked, why do Americans watch so much television? And or it was the other way around. The American asked why the Chinese man they they don't watch a lot of television. They said, well, we know it's all propaganda, so we don't tune in. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they're like, well, Americans don't know that yet. Mm -hmm. And that's the sad fact of it. Is is mm -hmm. is I mean, I, and then you know, there's there's just some of the the stuff on TV is just so low IQ. It's mm -hmm. like I got stuck watching something the other day in between a, a a football game, which I don't actually watch very much often either. But I was like, there, you know, the people are cheering, and it's just like I'm like, is this how stupid we've become? Like you can tell it's kind of staged and it's rigged, mm -hmm. and it's like, oh my god, it's like idiocracy mm -hmm. um, coming true, and it's just it's somewhat sad. But what do we do, MJ, as entrepreneurs? It is, it huh? But what do, what do we do as entrepreneurs, as us trying to live these lives of abundance? What's the next step for us? Well, <laughs> you you don't play the game; you serve the game. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's essentially what we're doing is we're not playing the game. I, I serve the game and I try, I try to tell people, here's the game that's afoot. You don't want to play that. Here's how you can win without playing the game because the game they want you to play is not winnable or they want you to think it is winnable. They want you to, you know, sell everything. They want you to live by the, you know, the trailer down by the river. And that, that's what they want you to do. And, and I teach a different way. I say you can live in abundance. You can be an entrepreneur. You can provide value. You can serve the game instead of playing it. And you can get filthy rich doing so. And you can do it in a matter of years, three years, five years, 10 years. You don't need 40 years like culture is trying to tell you. You got to stop chasing money, start chasing needs. You have the sense framework. You want to share your sense framework? I, I, I love it. It really helped me with the Jake and Gino community as far as the needs, the entry, the control, the scale and time. You want to hit those because that's what every entrepreneur needs to focus on. It's an amazing framework. Sure. You'll find the sense framework in all three of the books I've written um, mm -hmm. because it is the core of my philosophy. Um, it is the backbone to the fat, to fast lane entrepreneurship. And fast lane entrepreneurship is we own a business that can make you exceptionally wealthy mm -hmm. while also giving you time freedom. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing better than having freedom to enjoy your wealth. You don't want to be wealthy, but you got no time, mm -hmm. um, which is the case with a lot of people. They, they have high paying jobs, you know, corporate management, but all they have is their weekend mm -hmm. to enjoy, you know, to enjoy their, the fruits of their labor. So the fast lane um, entrepreneurship is a structure that will allow you to accumulate massive wealth through the power of entrepreneurship, fast lane entrepreneurship, while also eventually giving you the time to enjoy. The sense framework is, stands for five different variables. Um, so if you're starting a business or you're actually running a business, you can uh, cross compare your business, your opportunity with these commandments to see if it is potentially possible for you for your business to actually change your life in a short period of time. And not just your life, but your family. Mm -hmm. um, so SENSE stands for control, which is C. E is entry. N mm -hmm. is need. T is time. And S is scale. Control basically says, just to give you the summarized version, control basically means you want to control most of all aspects of your business where you don't want one person or one corporation to basically destroy your business with one decision. Mm -hmm. So a good example is if you're making $5 million a year because you sell on Amazon and then one day Amazon says, well, we're canceling your business because you violated the rules. Mm -hmm. And then you're out of business, just like that, one decision. Mm -hmm. That means you're violating control. Entry means starting a business has to be a process, not an event. If you get in business in a matter of an hour, you probably don't have a business because you're not solving any problems. Mm -hmm. Entry has to be a process. You're solving some problems. You're creating value skew. So the, the longer it takes or the shorter it takes to get into business, probably the less effective the opportunity is. Mm -hmm. Need is the most important. Provide value. Provide something that people want, what people need. And you'd be surprised at how many entrepreneurs don't know this. Oh, I'm following my passion. Well, no one needs your passion. You know, no one needs this. No one needs that. Provide some freaking value that's going to compel someone to open their wallet and say, you know what? I like what you're offering here. Here's my money. Mm -hmm.
That's the most important. And then there's tea time. We're narcissists though, right? It's about us. <laughs> exactly, but that sells books. <laughs> Follow your passion sells books because that means you can ride ponies and play video games and make a profit. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying is it, 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 to the narcissistic culture, the me, 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 that sells books. That sounds wonderful. Amen. You mean I don't have to endure any struggle. I don't have to do what I hate. That's my philosophy. The more you're willing to do what you hate, the more you will succeed, not do what you love. I mean, even in my publishing company today, I still do things I absolutely hate. <gasps> How I dare you, MJ? <laughs> I don't need to, but... I still do it because I understand that's part of the process. So starting a business is never fairy tales and rainbows and fun. A lot of times- Can I give a quick story on this just for a second? Because sure. I, I did this shit when I was 25, uh, always loved sports, played football, et cetera. And all this follow your passion shit. I went to become a personal trainer. So I was doing it. I was doing sales during the day and mm -hmm. I was doing personal training in the evening. I, I stopped going to the gym because I was so sick of it. And it made my skin crawl because I had these people that were, oh, Jake, I don't want to do the reps. I don't want to <laughs> do it. And I became like their bitch towel where they just would spew on me. It was, it was like. It was kind of like a, a shrink whiner thing where I would literally just have to sit there and listen to people complain and not want to do it. And I was like, you're here to get results or are you here to, to whine and bitch? And so I, I it literally started making me like not want to go. I stopped doing what I enjoyed, which I, I enjoyed working out, but I thought, oh, follow your passion. So I went to, to you know do something in the gym. That was not following my passion either. So I think it's uh, it, it is very messed up. And, when, and what I find is that when you become competent because you put the hours in and you become good at something and then that thing is making you money and you're able to do more of it and continue to grow, that's when this shit gets real and interesting. And Correct. that's when you start to really enjoy it. And, if, and, and to you know, quote Steve Jobs, feel like you never worked a day in your life Absolutely. because you're, you're in the damn zone and you're yep. crushing it. That's when the shit feels good. Not because I feel so sunshine and ponies in this yeah, crap. Yeah. Like and th that's another danger I wrote about, uh, about following your passion is you, then you hate your passion mm -hmm. because you, that's exactly your, what happened. That's, that's exactly you, what happened. You yeah. attach it to money. You attach it to, Oh my God, I got to pay the mortgage. And you know, I used to love to drive when I was young. So what I, what did I do? I followed my passion. I started getting jobs delivering flowers and driving limousines and doing all this shit. To this day, I'm over 50 now. To this day, I hate driving now. Oh. You know, and the only way- <laughs> And you I ruin could, that for yourself. You gotta, you gotta sometimes protect it. this stuff, you know, that you enjoy. even when I owned a yeah. Lamborghini, I still hated driving. And, and I, that was, and I was actually- That was yes. just because it was hard to get out of, right? You're like, <laughs> yeah, you oh, my know, back. You have to have good squat. <laughs> That's right. You know, squat That's right. Mechanics. And you have uh, to have the jeans that flex, right? You can't have the tight jeans, right? So, <laughs> so um, actually that was me trying to enjoy driving again was why I was interested in fast cars and, and flashy cars because I hated driving and it gave me back some of the joy of driving, which didn't last long. Um, so anyways, we were talking about the sense framework and that was need. We were talking about passion. Uh, T is time. Uh, eventually, you want to be able to be able to walk away from your business, have systems in place that where you can um, have this, you know, have money coming in 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The reason why I was re able to retire early and live in affluence and live where I want and all this other good stuff is because I make money 24 hours a day, seven days a week, regardless what I'm doing. So it's like being punched in at a job, but you had never punched out. I haven't punched out in 25 years. So think of how you can accumulate wealth under those metrics. Mm -hmm. And the final is scale. Eventually, you want to be able to scale your product to not hundreds, but thousands and millions. And this is why the internet has created more millionaires in the last 20 years than any other medium out there, because it has made scale incredibly powerful for the average individual. And don't mistake scale uh, with the internet as a, um, oh, you need to start an internet business. No, the internet is just merely a channel. You can have a local business, but also has an internet presence that is able to scale to a worldwide audience. Mm -hmm. So that's the framework, the sense framework, C-E-N-T-S, control, entry, need, time, and scale. So MJ, now that you're you know, your businesses are throwing off so much cash. As the entrepreneur, you're taking your, your income and it, 
and putting into other vehicles, where are you putting that money uh, in vehicles? Because now you've already created wealth. Now you're, I guess you're sort of preserving wealth and you're chasing yield. Where do you see that money going? Where are the opportunities? Well, I, I actually, I'm not a typical investor. Um, I think the stock market is way overpriced. Mm -hmm. I think it's way overheated. So I don't mm -hmm. have a lot of money in, in stocks. Mm -hmm. um, I like things that are boring and things that are not exciting. So, um, you know, when I do invest in stocks, it's usually in dividend stocks that throw mm -hmm. off quarterly cash. It's usually um, in uh, tax-free municipal bonds, mm -hmm. which is exceedingly boring. Uh, these, are, these are not things that are going to make someone rich, um, mm -hmm. but they're great ways to generate redundant cash flow that comes month after month or quarter after quarter. Um, I have a lot of, uh, own a lot of REITs, real estate investment trusts which again, I think is a great investment because they're also inflation protected uh, with the way that inflation is nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, I don't think cash is a very good investment because it, it keeps being inflated by mm -hmm. central bankers and politicians that continue to print unmercifully. I mentioned uh, before the call that I just bought a house. Uh, it was several million dollars or more than I wanted to pay, but I didn't look at it as a uh, housing decision. I looked at it as a financial decision mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I wasn't buying a house. I was buying bricks and drywall and, and stone and electrical conduit. That's what I was buying. Mm -hmm. uh, so traditionally speaking, um, as far as investments, active investments, I like selling options and I have been doing that for 20 years and mm -hmm. have been doing it, uh, especially in this market, uh, pretty, pretty damn well. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So earlier today, Gene and I were having this conversation, actually, where he was uh, making the argument as to why it would be good to potentially sell one of our buildings. And my point to him was, what are you going to trade it into? Because I don't want to hold dollars right now. That, that is like the last thing that I want to have. So what, what is your, your take on this? I mean, you've discussed it a little bit right now, but are you, are you trying to you know, get out of dollars and, and find assets to buy um, or are you, you, you sitting on cash? Uh, I'm not sitting on a lot of cash. Um, and again, that's the reason why I, I bought a exceedingly big house to live in because I was trading in cash and for drywall mm -hmm. and bricks yeah. and land and whatnot. So I bought a, I bought a house in an area that is um, growing uh, that, that likely will not lose me any money on like, you know, cash sitting in a bank. But your question is interesting because if I had the answer, I would tell you, where do you put, where do you put that? I mean, um, my best bet is real estate investment trusts or real estate, because I do not think um, it, th this is that it's going to be a bubble like last time in 2008, when things just crashed, because mm -hmm. back then it was sign your name and you get the money. Mm -hmm. This time, it's much different. I actually took a small mortgage on this house I just purchased because the money was so damn cheap. I got a loan for 2%. And the, I couldn't believe it was like I got audited to get the money. And um, the, the loan officer said, you know, it doesn't matter the size of the loan. It could be 200000 or $2 million. Everyone's got to go through this, this type of auditing with, you know, show us this. They asked me, they said, the guy, the loan officer, I was actually astounded. He came back to me and said, hey, in 2018, you made a $300,000 transfer from this bank account to that. What was that? And I'm like, you're asking me about something three years ago? Three years ago. ago. <laughs> I'd be like, dude, I can't remember what happened last week. You, exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, and, 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 but, it, but it crystallized that this, this housing boom or this, you know, this whatever's going on right now, it's different. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's going to go down. I think it will flatline a little bit and maybe go up. I want to, I want to, I want to talk about this a little bit because I think it's going to be more localized because you're seeing, you know, migration patterns much different than you did uh, yep. Yep. prior. Okay. And you're also seeing asset classes where the whole thing just shit the bed, where I think here you're going to see potential different assets get hurt where other assets perform. And, and I'm, and by the way, I completely agree with you. Uh, so we are the the level below the REIT. We just buy multifamily buildings and hold them internally. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. So we're looking for more of these. We're looking to build these. So for ourselves, it's always looking for the next one to buy that makes some sort of fucking sense right now in this crazy market. 
And and then other things like I've bought some land and we're looking to even just get dirt right now. And uh, I'm dabbling in the metals, honestly, real metals, you know, mm-hmm. little, little, little silver, a little, little gold here and there, because I just want, I want something physical. I do not, I'm running from dollars as, as much as possible. But the problem is we just, we just exited a market and we got paid big on it for selling an asset up there. So now it's like, we got to redeploy this because I don't want to sit on this shit. Yes, and I think that's okay. that's a great distinction. It's physicality. Um, yeah. I, I think I think that's basically as simple as you can make it. Something with physicality, a house, a piece of land, metals, and, and that's and that would be my strategy going forward. And that has been my strategy uh, going forward. And and business assets as well. A, a business you yep. can raise your prices if inflation something yes. weird happens. You can raise your prices. Um, and, that, and that's, again, most people don't have this luxury, you know, with when they have their job and they're stuck doing what culture wants them to do. And this is this is the game that you're you're stuck in. And what I try to preach is this is the game that we don't want to play. We want to get out of the game so we can be proactive and not be part of this. We don't want to be victims of the system. We want to be winners of the system because we have chosen not to play it. You know, what's really scary now that you got me thinking is if you take whatever the fire thing is that you're talking about before and then, and then you tie, are you bro? And then you, well, I never heard of it. And then you tie it in with Dave Ramsey. Don't use debt. Uh. You're really, you're really screwing yourself because (laughs) dude, you're, you're telling me it's a bad idea. If I go get a cash flowing apartment building where I have non-recourse debt that the residents are paying. I don't agree with that person. I don't have personal debt in my life, but if I'm going to get good business debt out there that allows me to scale and grow and you're telling me that's a bad idea. I, I, I think that combined with fire is the, is the sure. poor man's formula right there. Sure. And doesn't, doesn't Mr. Ramsey live in your neck of the woods in like a 15,000 square foot palace? And where did he make his money? He made his money yeah. with a business and, and, and borrowing money. That's where he made his, his, exactly. his money from. And, that's, and, and again, I talk about this in my books as well. You have people who practice certain, um, certain strategies and then they mm-hmm. teach other strategies. The strategies that they're teaching is not what put them in their fifteen thousand dollar, fifteen thousand square foot mansion. Mm-hmm. It's a paradox to practice. Everything I teach, everything I stand behind, is why I have the life I have now. I'm, there's no divergence there. Mm-hmm. What I enjoy this life because exactly what I'm teaching. I'm not teaching you to save ten percent of your paycheck, wait forty years, and go live down by the river. But yet I live in a fifteen thousand square foot palace. Mm-hmm. Here's I the thing agree. too. You want to enjoy the money while you're young, not just when, when you hit 60, if right? you hit 60, bro. Absolutely. If, 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 if you could go hit by a fucking bus tomorrow, you don't know that you're going to make it that far. Mm-hmm. Hey, hey, have you guys heard of the book die with zero? No, it sounds uh, familiar, but I don't know it. It's called die with zero. Um, I think the author is Bill Perkins. Great book. I don't agree with all of it, but it, it really puts in perspective that you know, if you die with five million dollars in the bank, that's five million dollars of experiences that you're not going to have, whether uh-huh. it's living in a nice house, taking an RV trip, uh, traveling, because as you get older, your experience, your ability to experience certain things starts to marginally decline mm-hmm. until to the point where you can't even do anything anymore. Mm-hmm. So he does a great job of framing that. Yes, you want to build your empire, build wealth, but at some point, there has to be a chasm where you start spending the money Mm -hmm. because you don't have, you know, the mistake is to think that we're going to live forever. You know, I just, I'm over 50 years old now. So most of my life is already gone. So I'm not very um, financially um, hamstrung now because I think to myself, well, I'm not going to be around, you know, maybe 25 years. That's it. So I'm not, I'm not going to be spending very, um, I'm going to be spending more uh, or spend thrifty, I guess mm-hmm. is what you say, mm-hmm. because I know I'm not going to be here in 25, 30 years. So I, I, I don't, I'm, not as much, I'm not as cautious anymore. And it does a great job of putting things in perspective. Um, it's a good book, good book to pick up if, um, to expand your perspective. The problem, MJ, is when you start saving your whole life and you're ready to retire, you have such a scarcity mindset. You're not tapping that two or three million dollars. You're living on twenty five grand a year anyway. Yeah. So you've been a miser your whole life, and you're going to continue to be a miser, you're and you'll never have any any of those experiences yeah. because all of a sudden you can't. That's for a rainy day. 
bro, yes. you, your days, it's not raining anymore. You're getting, fun, you're getting hail and snow, you know, yes. you enjoy it, but you can't enjoy it because you've been conditioned to be like a, a saver. And there's nothing wrong with saving, save to buy assets and let assets pay for your lifestyle. That's what we, we practice what we teach. Our first property was a 25 unit property back in 2013. It was $600,000. We still own that property today. It nets me, just me, three grand a month. I've paid my first daughter's four years of college with that property. My son's a sophomore. All six of my kids are going to go to college from that one crappy little <laughs> crack den infested asset. And I'm going to own that thing. And it's going to be worth $3 million in 15 years. And I, so that's the idea. Save money and buy assets with that money. Let those assets pay for your lifestyle. That is so far from um, the 95% of the people yeah. in this country. And I wish they would adopt that mindset, but they and, don't. And, 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 but see, that, that makes you a danger to the system because- you, you, uh, they, you, we can't have uh, Gino here living that kind of lifestyle, you know, not working, mm -hmm. not, not consuming. Is I mean, that's, and that's what I'm saying is mm -hmm. they're trying to convince people that you want to own nothing and you still can be happy. Well, you're damn happy because you own stuff that is funding your lifestyle, that's mm -hmm. funding your, your, your children's education and you're not putting in 60, 80 hours a week for some retirement fantasy predicated on stock market bullshit. Uh -huh. So um, There's going to be a study that comes out after this show about how Gino was wrong and how the, the fire mentality is right. You know, you're going to see this. They're going to put some numbers behind it. They're going to fire my this ass. Is, Let them this fire is where he ass. was confused by, folks. He was wrong. Well, you know what, Jake? Ironically enough, the reason why I knew the fire movement was one of our students about two years ago joined and they were predicated upon this. They joined the Jake and Gino community and all of a sudden they're like, this doesn't work. And their mind shift has radically changed. And Fernando and Anna, I'm giving a big shout out to you. They're like, I read more books since I joined Jake and Gino in two years than I did since I graduated college. And they're like, we're living meager. We're two engineers making a buck 50 plus a year. They do good, good paychecks. And they're like, well, we retire in three years. But when they joined us, like the light bulb went off and it's like, holy crap. And now you know what they did? They quit their jobs, moving down to Florida taking care and helping their parents with their businesses and continue to buy assets. So they are a threat to the system. That's what MJ's talking about. Cause all of a sudden they've gained control of their lives and they're living yes. lives of abundance. Freaking awesome, bro. Absolutely. Uh, yep. uh, I got one last question before we go to the short ones and you've built an amazing brand. I love everything you stand for. Do you have any tips on, on building a, a brand? Yeah, sure. Um, you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of new entrepreneurs who um, hey, you know, I want to be, yeah, I want to be an entrepreneur. Well, they think they think they need to invent the next iPhone. Mm -hmm. They think they need to disrupt an industry, become the next Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk. You don't need to do any of that. Entrepreneurship mostly is about improvement, or what I call value skew. I discussed value skew in Unscripted and the Great Rat Race Escape. Value skew is anything that compels someone to give you money. So whenever you purchase something from something as innocuous as a bag of potato chips, to a house, to a stereo system. There's a reason why you bought it. And more often than not, it's not because it was the best price. Mm -hmm. More often than not, it's something that attracted you in your head, which is with the concept of value skew. For example, the potato chip example. Perhaps the potato chips say non-GMO. Well, you picked that one because it said non-GMO. Mm -hmm. That's a value skew. So you can Create a business based on one value skew because you're better at something than the rest of the groupings offerings, the rest mm -hmm. of what culture is offering. So the more skewing of value you can do, we're better at this, we're better at that, we're better at this. So that could be customer service, that could be your labels better. It could be the story behind your company, why you're in business is better and it identifies with your potential buyer. That's why they buy from you. So the more value skew you can, you can be better at than your competition, the better business opportunity you have. So you can build a business based on two or three skewed variables that compel people to give you money. And that's, that's in an essence what entrepreneurship is about, is just being better than what is available out there. When people can discern that, they will give you money. Mm -hmm. I'm going to prove your point right now because my wife, uh, you know, the last little bit has got on this uh, clean eating kick, right? Uh -huh. And it has to have ingredients that she can understand or she's not buying it. Tell so them to stop talking to my wife, please. The two dude, of them are talking together dude, about this. They drive me nuts. Okay, bro. Dude, the potato <laughs> chips that are in my cabinet right now. She buys in these huge boxes because they don't have them at our grocery store and they get sent in the mail now and they contain avocado oil, 
salt and potatoes. And that's <laughs> it. So you're fucking spot on, dude. And I'm yeah. going through it right now. And I probably pay fucking 10 bucks a bag for these fucking things. So. Sure. And that's a good example is I picked up a granola bar. Yeah. And the, the list of ingredients was this long. It was like, a, it's like reading War and Peace. I'm like, this is a goddamn <laughs> granola bar. Yeah, you're not finding that in my house anymore, unfortunately. So everything, you know. Yeah, we gotta, we gotta <laughs> but that's a value skew. That's we right. only have three ingredients. That's a value yeah. skew. Yeah. You got to go back and listen to that. Hold on a second, Jake. Everyone's got to really go back and listen to that two or three minutes because that's the essence of business right there. USP, you want to call it. I love the word value skew. That totally uh, love that. Dude, and here's the thing. People are buying what they want to buy. Okay. There's money flushing through the system right now. There's sure are print enough of it. So don't be too afraid on price if you're you're bringing the value. So, Mm -hmm. all right, guys, let's take a quick time out here from our sponsor. Are you looking for ways to improve your life? Here at Jake and Gino, our mission is to empower students through financial education and the vehicle of multifamily investing. Yes, Jake. We agree that a person with financial intelligence can change the world for the better. We've created our proprietary three-step framework, buy right, manage right, and finance right, that we teach to our community. This framework, along with education, our one-on-one mentorship, on-site boot camps, and the amazing community has propelled our students to massive success. We've all been there. We've had so many students that have been able to shift their mindset, overcome limiting beliefs, and set a clear path to achieve their goals. Whether you're currently fixing and flipping, wholesaling, or buying single-family rentals, and you know that multifamily investing is the right vehicle for you, I encourage you to visit jakeandgino.com forward slash apply to schedule your complimentary consultation with our team And I want to let you know, this isn't a high pressure sales call. It's really just a discovery call to get to know each other better and see if we're a good fit for working together. And if for any reason we're not a good fit, our team has tons of resources we will share with you to help you along your journey. If you're ready to stop spinning your wheels, go to jakeandgino.com forward slash apply and schedule your call now. All right, we're back. So uh, took a took a little note here as we're going through it because this seems to be a, a hot button topic for folks. Gino, uh, you mentioned you know Fernando there moving to Florida. You know I relocated from New York. Gino relocated from New York, and you just made a move personally. Uh, I'd love to hear the thought process, um, how you rank the states, and, and just a little bit more elaborate the story in, in terms of how you you came to your conclusion there and 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 where you went. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure, I recently moved from Arizona to Utah. And had you asked me five years ago, hey, you're going to be living in Utah in five years, I would say, what? You're nuts. Take a hike. You're full of shit. Full of crap. Um, but it happened. Um, I, I was in Arizona for 25 years. Great place to live. Um, but it was getting a little too crowded. Um, a lot of, in, a lot of uh, emigration from other states. Um, the politics has started to change there. Um, they passed a, they get, they get these stupid ballot initiatives. They put on the, put on the voting thing. Um, they passed a law that increased my state taxes by 77%, to which I said, no, I'm not paying that. Sorry. So um, we decided to move to another state. And they vote was, with the ballot. You vote with your feet. Got it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, although the legislature, apparently they nullified that law, but you know, the writing was on the wall. It's coming. That, um, you know, the voters there thought that, you know, me paying 8% of my income to the state was fair. I said, no, it's not. So I left. Um, but the states we were considering was Wyoming, tax-free state, Nevada, tax-free state, Washington, also tax-free state, um, Tennessee, another uh, tax-friendly state, um, Michigan, somewhat, somewhat, you know, favorable, um, didn't choose Florida, um, simply because I don't like humidity. Um, But ultimately we decided on going to Utah because we figured it was the most business friendly, the most politically stable uh, state and um, very sunny like Arizona, um, except in the winter time. Um, So, but we're looking forward to a change of seasons and whatnot, but ultimately it came down to business business friendliness, um, political stability, uh whether the mormons uh, offer the stability too right well absolutely yeah the, the, the mormon the state, stability is a thing yeah the, the state is heavily influenced by a mormon population which i am not mormon um but um to be honest with you i've lived i've lived around mormons for most of my life uh, in arizona 
and they're just wonderful people to live around, very friendly, very helpful, um, very business oriented. Um, so, hey, why not? You know, so we made the move uh, and, and if we don't like it, hey, we can live somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't choose Wyoming because you need $5 million to live in a trailer in Wyoming, um, which I didn't know until I started looking. That's at what house. I was just going to say. I don't think people are aware of how expensive it's Is it that gotten. expensive yeah. though? Really? I didn't, I didn't, I mean, is it because there's just not a lot there and this, it's, there's just well, Jackson scarcity? Jackson Hole or... is the place where uh, you want to be. And uh-huh. that's where all the Fed bankers do their vacations. Uh-huh. And um, what's you know, the show? There's a great show out there right now with uh, the guy that did Field of Dreams, like Kevin Costner. There's a show about Wyoming. You guys know this one? Oh, oh Yellowstone. Yeah. Yellowstone. Oh, yeah. man, that's good. Yeah, Gina, have you seen it. this yet? I, I haven't seen it. show yet, was no. great. Yes. I have, I've not seen it, but I've heard it was really good. Guys, you got to, yeah, yeah. You'll get your Wyoming kick if you watch <laughs> that. So, yeah. In um, Nevada, we didn't choose because um, it seemed the pricing was getting out of whack. Politics there. The, the governor still has people wearing masks and, no, I'm not interested in that. So. I don't think you're getting the stability that you're looking for in Nevada there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, ultimately, we went with Utah. And again, like I said, when you have a business, um, you have these you have these choices to live wherever you want. And I can tell you, it was pretty it was pretty fun and interesting looking shopping for houses in five six different states that which you can see what you can get and what you can't and what the taxes are. It, it really is a, a, an incredible experience. Did you hone in on a specific market in each state and then started to look that way or were you were you a little more open? Yes, to that? yes. Yeah. Um, in Utah, we started in Park City, that area, um, which was ungodly expensive as well. Um, we actually, we settled on a, um, Alpine, uh, Utah, which is south, southeast of Salt Lake City. Um, but yeah, I visited a lot of these places, kind of looked, got a feel for the So place. you got vacations out of it too, right? That's the way to do it, folks, is you get to visit each one and spend sure. some time there, put some time into each market, right? Yeah, yeah. See, you know, you get a feel for it because a lot of times it's a feeling, you know, like, yeah, I can live here or, or you know, oh, I don't want to live here. You know, like, like in Nevada, I was like, yeah, I just can't see myself living here. It kind of had a dirty feel to it. And mm-hmm. um, <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, it, um the, really, the walk really. of shame coming off the strip was getting into the neighborhoods. <laughs> <laughs> so did you um, did you rent first or was it straight into the house? Uh, no, no, no. We we bought the house um, and I then made it, move. And then yeah. uh, I put my Arizona house up for sale. Uh, the Arizona house uh, was up for sale, I think, for four days. Um, you a little bidding war going on? Oh, huge bidding war. Um, I got a hundred and almost $200,000 over asking price. Um, I made 63% on my money in two years. Mm-hmm. 63% on that house. Mm-hmm. And so what do you say to Robert Kiyosaki when he says that a house is not an asset? I don't agree with a lot of what he says, but that's another, that's another, podcast. <laughs> that's another hours show. Uh-huh. He's a good marketer. He's a good marketer. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but there, but there you go again is, is, is he a really a real estate investor? Or is he more of a seminar guy mm-hmm. selling books and seminars? And, and I think Ken coaching? McElroy is the source of his real estate investing and he, uh, he rides the, the Kenny Mac wave. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, right. and that's one of the things I like to stress is all I do is write. I sell books. That's it. I don't have a course. I don't have a a five-figure seminar. I don't have a a coaching program. I don't have a mentorship program. If if you say, hey, I like what this MJ MJ guy says, the most I can get somebody for get somebody for is $15 on a book. That's it. And you can return the book to Amazon and say, I didn't like it. So I don't sell anything other than what I write. That's it. So on the on the the book topic, um, love to hear from folks and you know spread books that have added value to your life. So anything in the last year or two that you've read that is worth sharing with the folks? Sure, I mentioned a Die with Zero uh, mm-hmm. by Bill Perkins. Um, I, as I said before, I don't agree with everything he wrote in there, but he does a great job of putting money in perspective in terms of how you know long you have to live. Yeah, and you know if you're dying with millions and millions and millions of dollars in, in the bank. You're, you're shortchanging yourself on experiences, you know, whether it's traveling or living in a nice house, driving the nice car you want or whatever you want there. Um, another, another book uh, that I recommend that's not really business oriented is The Surrender Experiment um, by Michael Singer. And it's kind of a spiritual book about meditation and whatnot, but he's actually an entrepreneur that started, I think, four or five companies with thousands of employees, sold it, public company. 
made up fortune, whatnot. But that's about um, looking at what life is throwing it, throwing at you instead of fighting it, surrendering to it. And I don't mean you surrender to everything. I'm just talking about whatever comes to your life. Instead of fighting it, just saying, hey, you know, maybe this is the way it's supposed to be. A great example is before we moved. We went to go pick up our moving truck. They said, oh, the, we don't have one for you. We're, we got to get out of here. We need a truck. No, we don't have it. The tire is screwed up. Well, we were pissed off for about five minutes until we said, you know what? Just surrender that. Maybe if we took this truck, we would be stranded in the middle of a desert somewhere with a desert somewhere with mm -hmm. a bad tire. Another example is when this house came up for sale, the house I just moved to, it went under contract within a day. And I said, hey, you know what? If that house came back, I would probably make a move on it this time. Well, sure enough, a week later, the house came back on the market. The contract fell through. So that to me- Why did it fall through? Uh-oh, what's going on with it? <laughs> uh, well, the, supposedly the guy just walked away. He, he, <gasps> ghosted the, he ghosted the inspection company. He ghosted the real estate agent. He ghosted everyone. So I came, I flew up the next day. I looked at it and eventually put an offer on it. But that's what I'm saying is mm -hmm. I, I saw that as a- you know, like, I don't want to say the universe, but life is throwing something your way instead of fighting it, look at it as a, as a more of an opportunity. A good, another example, my real estate agent was out of town and I was bitching and moaning. I want to put my house up for sale right now. She's like, well, I can't because I'm out of town. Wait till next week, which I did. And I, and eventually I said, you know, I'm going to surrender to that. Let her go out of town. Let her do her thing. We'll put it up next week. And then I told you, I got a bidding war on the house sold it way over asking. So maybe that was the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. Have you read um, Loving What Is? I've never heard of it. Who's it by? Ugh. I'm going to look it up real quick while we're here. So it's very, uh, it, it sounds somewhat uh, similar. And uh, it, it's a book that um, kind of helped me out the same way. Uh, let's see, Loving What, uh, Byron Katie. Oh, um, I've heard of Byron Katie. Yeah, loving what is. It's just a very, very similar concept is being yeah. more accepting of the world, loving it. Like, um, you know, this it's person having... told me I can't get a truck right now. Okay, I'm accepting of it. It is. Let's let's not What's fight next this. Step? Exactly. Yeah, yes. exactly. And, and and ultimately, to your point, that's probably good. Maybe I don't want to be working with these folks anyways. Why am I going to force a relationship here that's going to result in more turmoil when I'm trying to jam it in there? So. I mean, that sounds exactly like what it is. Instead of being angry because something didn't happen the way you want it, accept it and then yeah. carry on. And is it really I, making that big of a deal in your life? You know, and yeah. you're going to probably benefit more from this. So many times I've been like, damn it, I've just wanted it because I, I just try to jam, jam, jam. And then it's like, sure. it worked out way better when I chilled the F out and saw a bigger yeah. picture than my immediate gratification. And some people were, I had some people because I recommended it on my text messaging group and they were like, how do you be unscripted if you're surrendering to everything? And I'm like, that's that's not what I'm saying. You're missing the point. You can direct your life, yes, but see, as you're directing it, what is coming in? They're not understanding you, though. Yeah, like they're they're, they're taking it too literally. Like sur when you're you're saying sur you're not saying like you're surrendering to the world. You're you're taking it and you you're, you're making an educated decision on what's coming in versus being emotional. It's Correct. actually more. It's a more strategic take on life in general than than the, what the they're taking that from an emotional stance versus a a, a you know objective position. So this right. is the this is what Covey talks about. It's your stimulus versus your response. We're animals. This is what differentiates us from most of the animal kingdom. You have a stimuli. You get stimulated. What's your response? We can we can have that choice. We can choose to respond. Most of the world nowadays, it's all about emotions and they can't control it. If you look at things logically and, and, and really think that through, that's what both of these books sound like they make you do. And you can make a much better decision if you do that. Yes. And be, be a lot happier. Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool. Gina, hold up the books. I know you got them there. I got to talk because it's on YouTube. I got the Great Rat Race this book is like 15 pounds. This is the one that changed my life. <laughs> he was life getting right his, his, his delt work out in right now. Millionaire Fast Lane. <laughs> and I got unscripted. And listen, everybody, as you're doing it, you need to read them and you need to take notes. It's not just something where you do it offhand. You need to read the books and you need to take notes while you're doing the books because they're fantastic. There's some concepts that MJ has, has put in the books, like the sense, just to, you know, put it back because it's all about space repetition. That's how you learn. You read something, you go back, and you continue to do it. And you need to get in there. That sense framework is worth it. And that branding, all about that value mm -hmm. skew, two huge components when you're becoming an entrepreneur. You, you got a fast lane wrap in you, Gina? I got a fast lane wrap. Yeah, absolutely. I got a fast lane wrap. You got the 12-year-old looking at the Lambo going, asking the right question. 
where did you do? What do you do for a living? Most people would actually say, man, what a jerk driving yeah. a Lambo. What's, what's up with him? No, MJ <laughs> asked the right question. So from there, he was destined for greatness, right? Took a little bit long, living in his mom's basement. Hey, I can vouch for that. I did that for a few years. Became a limo driver twice, sold that business, got the hell out of Chicago, moved to Scottsdale, Arizona for 25 years where he flourished, ends up taking control and saying, I'm never going to leave this place. But you know what? Five years ago, he said, I'm never leaving. But you know what? He left. And it's all about decisions, reading these books and putting these he had books a choice. together. And he had he the choice. He was a free man with a choice. choice. And the yes. great part about it is he's truly financially free. The definition that we had years ago, not the definition that we have today. I like his definition a lot more, Jake. Let's say you. Hey, man, maybe he can go to Home Depot and get one of those sheds and turn it into a tiny house by the river. <laughs> but he has the choice, right? He can do it if he wants to. So. MJ, where can the listeners get a hold of you? Uh, sure. Uh, the fastlaneforum.com. Uh, that's a business forum that discusses the fast lane sense framework. I am there every single day. I'm actually contributing. Uh, of course, on Amazon, you can find my books um, there at all times. And I also have a text messaging group, which you can find information on that as well um, at the forum. Uh, that's a telegram group and an actual messaging group. Uh, so fastlaneforum.com is always the best bet. Hey, always a pleasure. MJ, thank you very much for spending some time with us. We've truly enjoyed it. You Thanks, MJ. Thanks for having me. It was, it was a good time. Thanks, guys.